Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you um, for joining us today and welcome to the TAPS Research and Data Symposium for Food and Nutrition. Uh, this session is titled Networking Strategies to Leave School Employed. My name is Karen Andrews and I'm a member of the symposium's planning committee. Before we get started, I would like to let you know that the session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. Please modify your name and or shut off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. Um, we ask that all attendees keep their audio off until the um, audience led question and answer portion at the end of the session. I might also suggest select speaker view in the upper right hand corner to highlight those who are presenting. Please submit any questions you have through the chat and we'll try to address them during the Q&A session towards the end of the panel. And with this in mind, uh, I will hand it over to our moderator, Violetta. She is a registered dietitian and currently a PhD candidate in food and nutrition policy and programs at the Friedman School. Prior to Tufts, she was working as a research assistant and project coordinator at the Cardiovascular Surgery Unit of Guatemala and the Institute of Nutrition of Central America and Panama. Her research interests focus on, the, on food environments and nutrition policies that shape children and adolescents' diets, topics in which she has published peer-reviewed articles. So I'll let you take it away, Violetta. Thank you so much, Caroline. Welcome everyone uh, to this symposium. So um, professional networking has become extremely important for graduate students. And these networks have the potential to not just lead to opportunities, but also allow students to exchange resources, help one another, provide, receive, provide and receive social support, and also build confidence. So this workshop is an opportunity for us to hear from uh, professionals and also TAFS alumni about their experiences and strategies for uh, professional networking. So I will now proceed to introduce each one of the presenters and then ask each one to tell us about their current role at their organizations. First, I would like to introduce Alana Davidson, uh, who serves as communications director for the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance. She has eight years of nonprofit and government experience promoting nutrition programs and policies in support of food and economic security. She has previously worked in DTA SNAP Outreach Unit, as well as the Food Research and Action Center in Share Our Strength, No Kid Hungry, and End Hunger CT. She holds a Master of Science in Food Policy and Applied Nutrition from the Friedman School and a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition Dietetics from the University of New Hampshire. Alana, please, in a few minutes, tell us um, about your role. Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, from whatever time zone you are joining us, uh, it's nice to be here with all of you. Um, as I said, my name is Alana. I am the Director of Communications at the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance, which is the state agency that administers the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, which used to be called um, Food Benefits, Food Stamps, as well as TANF or Cash Benefits uh, for Massachusetts residents. And in this role, I oversee the press for the agency, our website, our social media, a lot of our external and internal communications. So I work closely with our policy units around client notices and text messages, um, as well as public comments agency submits for federal rulemaking and working with our sister agencies on partnerships uh, to address food insecurity holistically across programs. And I'm uh, excited to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, now I would like to introduce Eliza Hallett, who is a policy analyst at the Center uh, for Health Systems Effectiveness, where she works to coordinate the center's mixed methods policy research projects focused on state Medicaid program and public policy innovations. Her interests include public health program evaluations relating to food and nutrition, substance use disorders, and stable housing. And she holds a master's degree in nutrition interventions, communications, and behavior change from the Friedman School. And she has also been involved in public health evaluation projects at the Rhode Island uh, Public Health Institute and also the University of Washington. Eliza, please, in a couple of minutes, um, tell us about your current role. 
Thank you so much, Violetta, and happy to be here with you all this morning for me since I'm out in Oregon. Um, like you just mentioned, I'm the I'm a policy analyst at the Centers for Health Systems Effectiveness at Oregon Health and Science University. It's a large academic medical center in the state of Oregon. Um, CHSC is a 30-person quasi-independent research center under the larger OHSU umbrella, and we work to, we have an academic research portfolio and a policy research portfolio. I'm on the policy side, and our main projects are to contract with state governments to run their independent evaluations of Medicaid 1115 waiver demonstration projects. So we currently work with the state of Oregon and the state of Washington as well as Virginia to coordinate their 1115 evaluations. Um, 1115 waivers for those who are less familiar with Medicaid policy are ways for states to kind of flex the rules of federal Medicaid policy to allow certain groups or um, different individuals to receive benefits that are not allowable under federal Medicaid rules. So uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services requires that these evaluation projects have an independent evaluator. So we serve as that evaluator, um, largely coming in kind of before these waiver applications are even submitted to draft evaluation plans for the state. And then all the way through um, the, the end of the demonstrations, a lot of these waivers are kind of renewed on an ongoing basis. And so we're working very closely with Oregon and Washington throughout that whole life cycle of the process. Um, but I am on the qualitative side more so, and also coordinating uh, quantitative the quantitative data analysis as well. But those reports are large, and you know can we're hoping that they're actionable. But those evaluation reports get sent to CMS at the end of those demonstration projects to kind of evaluate how the the waiver worked and how it functioned for different groups of people with the with that informing kind of the state's next waiver evaluation. Um, I also have worked on some smaller policy projects, for example, a project on behavioral health workers in the state of Oregon and getting more flexibilities for Medicaid reimbursement rates for those professionals, both licensed and unlicensed professionals. So it kind of spans the gamut of social determinants of health policy research. Um, and food is, you know, comes in there with SNAP and, and TANF benefits for sure. Um, but I would say that I am kind of squarely in the public health policy research space right now. That's very interesting. Thank you, Liza. Um, now I would like to introduce Amy Yang, who is a registered dietitian with over five years of experience working in long-term care. She holds a bachelor's degree from McGill University and recently completed the master's in nutrition science and policy at the Friedman School. She is currently working in long-term care, but looking to transition into the data science or health, health tech space. Amy, please, in a couple of minutes, tell us about your current role. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. Um, so currently, I'm working in long-term care. I do clinical dietetics. Um, for those who are not in clinical, um, it's a lot of assessments, a lot of seeing patients, a lot of um, just interacting with all kinds of departments, um, nursing, social services, activities. Um, it's been really great working in long-term care. I think it's really different from working in a hospital or working in public policy. Um, it's very different from, I think, what a lot of people expect working with um, older adults. But um, I'm really happy to talk about my experience and how I got here because I do know quite a few people are in the DPD program looking to get into dietetics as well. So if you're interested in long-term care, feel free to reach out and connect with me on that. Thank you so much, uh, Amy. And lastly, I would like to introduce Emily Celiotes. Celiot <laughs> um, Emily received her master's degree in biomedical and molecular nutrition from the Friedman School in 2017. And while conducting food science research at UC Davis, she started working part-time as a career development instructor in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. In that role, she received formal training in career development. And after two years there, she started her own career coaching business. And currently she is a professional development consultant for the, for the Grad Pathways Institute at UC Davis and is building a personal and professional growth community called Golden, Golden Acorn. 
Emily, please, um, in a couple of minutes, tell us about your current work. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I kind of am doing um, a couple different things right now. I really would say I'm a coach um, and a consultant. Um, I really kind of, you know, started in food and nutrition science and came to Davis and did really a lot of scientific research um, and just kind of coincidentally found this opportunity to work in the um, College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences um, on the career development side and, and really fell in love with that. Um, so I, um, you know, as a career coach um, and professional development consultant, I work with grad students and especially at the Grad Pathways Institute, I work specifically with grad students and then in my own business, I work with students and um, also young professionals. Um, who you know are kind of feeling lost or confused um, about what they want to do next in their career, um, and I really help support them through networking, interviewing strategies, um, personal branding. Um, I, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, and you know, um, really try to help people build their personal brands and, and networking through through that. Um, you know, however, I also do some consulting still on the food um, and nutrition side. Um, when I started my business, I took some business classes. So I, uh, you know, right now I'm also working as like a consultant for UC Davis. They're looking at a, a sustainable agriculture. Um, I'm looking at uh, basically like commercializing a sustainable agriculture technology. So how can we kind of turn scientific research at, you know, food and food research at universities um, into startups kind of into the entrepreneurship space. So that's, that's another area that, that I'm really interested in. Thank you so much, um, Emily. It's very interesting to hear uh, the different fields and different interests um, and the amazing work that um, our presenters today are currently doing. Uh, I will now proceed to ask a few questions uh, regarding each uh, of our presenters networking experiences. And after these questions, I will open the space uh, for the audience. Please submit any questions that you may have through the chat, and we will try to address them in the, in the, la in the last part of this session. So hold on to them or ask them in the chat. Um, I would like to start with one question for all presenters. And first of all, I would like to know which networking experiences were the most helpful for you in preparing for your current position. Let's start with Amy. Sure, uh, for me, I've um, been in long-term care for a while. So um, I would say um, connecting with peers is really important for me. Um, I actually got my current role because I, um, I knew someone who worked in it and um, and I think a lot of people are, they're always going out connecting, you know, to people because of their job titles, they're a director or something, a manager or something. And what we forget is that, you know, we're at Tufts and we have a lot of um, peers who are really smart, really capable. And in a couple of years, they're going to be managers and directors. Um, and I think a lot of students, are, like when they're students, they forget that, um, you know, these people are going to be really important connections for you in a couple of years. So for me, I would my number one advice is to connect with your fellow peers while you're still students and really get to know them um, as human beings, not just job titles. And um, in a couple of years, when you may be looking for a new job or if you're looking to transition to new space, these are gonna be really important connections for you to have. Eliza. Yeah, I think Amy just brought up a really important point. And for my networking experience, it's been very place-based intentionally. So I think what I mean by that is, uh, you know, Tufts is obviously all the way on the East Coast. I'm from Oregon originally and kind of always had the goal to move back to the West Coast after graduating. I ended up staying in Boston for two years and, and working there, which was wonderful. But my Friedman internship was in Seattle, Washington. And I knew that that was an opportunity for me to connect, to start connecting with folks that were in my field on in the general geographic area that I was trying to be in eventually. And so 
I remember during my internship summer, really kind of going up and down the I-5 corridor, like for organizations that were interesting to me that I had heard about before and just uh, having informational interviews with folks and those experiences and those connections even though they didn't directly help me get this position that I'm in right now, were you know, a friend of a friend or those connections were still really important to me feeling like I had a professional network on the West Coast. Um, and I felt more comfortable kind of making the leap from Boston to Portland because I, I had those public health or public health nutrition connections out here. Um, so I think that that would be kind of the, the main thing I think about just trying to envision if you have a really strong desire to live in a very specific place, thinking about place-based networking is really important um, and will kind of set you up for having a professional community when, when you are job searching. That's, that's very important, um, Elisa. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Alana, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think for me, one of the um, most important things for me was networking among my advisors and professors. I think in undergrad and in graduate school, that was uh, meeting and just talking with professors about what path makes sense, their experience, their advice. Um, when I was graduating, I was deciding between going to Washington, D.C. and trying to get on the Hill um, and doing advocacy at that level versus staying at the state and and do I want to stay at, I was interning at the state legislature do I you know want to do that or do I want to be at the state agency and and one of the advice I got um from one of the Freedman professors was think about what you want to do federally and try it out at the state level because a lot of the times the feds will be looking at people at the state to move into those jobs um and that really shaped kind of where where I ended up um after after Tufts and so I think talking to professors um, around you who have that experience and can also connect you with other people at other uh, universities or connections they have has been really um, important for me. Thank you so much, Alana. Emily. Um, yeah, it's also great advice so far. I think maybe what I could touch on is since I kind of pivoted from the science side to the career professional development side, right? If you're kind of trying to pivot fields, um, networking becomes even more important. Um, so I had already built like a strong, I would say professional network at UC Davis. Um, and so being able to reach out to people that were part of the UC Davis community um, was huge. But um, yeah, so I think informational interviews, I don't know how familiar with, you are with them, but really basically like um, other presenters touched on them. I mean, that's a really good strategy, basically just being preemptive, really trying to build relationships with people that have positions that you want in advance of when you're actually looking for those positions. So like for the professional development consultant role, for example, you know, it was a year ago, I, um, you know, I was still doing like food research and I realized I was really interested in this. So I directly reached out to the assistant director at the Grad Pathways Institute. And I was like, you know, I'm really interested in this, you know, and he was on, I was on his radar for a long time. And so then when a position did open up six months later, he, you know, I was the first person that he thought of. So I, I think that's just, you know, the way the way to try to go about it is just to be as proactive as possible and then when a position does open up the person will think of you thank you so much um emily for sharing that and um yes i i um from your experience uh in career development um and feel from your uh passion in this subject um what would be um, an advice that you have for students who um, who do, do not still feel comfortable with, with approaching people? They don't, don't know, as you were saying, maybe, you know, like approaching a, a professor or someone who, who you wish you would be working with um, or find it difficult to, to make social connections. Would you have um, advice for students who are... Um, who are having those difficulties? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I do think, you know, I have, I'm fairly comfortable with like cold emailing people where I know a lot of people or messaging people where I know a lot of people are not um, as much. And I I mean, I definitely would say in that case, just start with, I mean, like the other presenters touched on really start with your immediate network, right? Start with alumni, start with students, start with, you know, colleagues from internships, right? Because then maybe the the fear aspect is a little lower. you know, just so I would, that, that would be my first piece of advice. Um, rather than just like cold reaching out to people, I, you know, that could be a little bit more intimidating. Yeah, I agree, Emily. Thank you for um, sharing that. Um, would anyone else, uh, uh, any of the, the other presenters had um, an experience like this or, or had any advice? say I think something um, particularly for for the women here today is getting uncomfortable with I don't want to say bragging about yourself but it's also maintaining relationships and so checking in with people every six months every how often just updating people on what's been happening any accomplishments you have can feel really uncomfortable Um, I think we're kind of conditioned to feel uncomfortable to do that particularly as women and so that's something that I still struggle with and and try to um, learn and improve on, but it's really important when continuing, not only making those connections and whether it's cold emailing someone or um, going to an event and then following up with someone after or whatever, but continuing that so that they know what you're doing and can think of you when when opportunities come up or when they're thinking about certain things. Um, And so it's getting comfortable with with the uncomfortable. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I agree. Getting uh, comfortable with the uncomfortable is something that um, we need to um, to think about. Um, Elisa, would you? Yeah, I would just I would just add to that. I agree with everything that's been said wholeheartedly, and think that even though it is scary to to cold email someone, I always just have to remind myself that the worst that will happen is that they don't respond and that, you know, no one can fault you for trying to be a proactive networker. And so if they don't respond, that's no skin off your back. You know, you you lost the 10 minutes crafting that email and that's okay. Um, and that it's it's worth maybe the uncomfortability to maybe have something come of it. Um, but if something doesn't, then then it's not like it doesn't reflect poorly on you at all. I think the opposite actually. Absolutely. And I also wanted to touch back on Emily's point with touch, um, networking with alum. Um, I know that the Career Center has a lot of alum and the alumni association also have a lot of events too, where you can connect with alum. And honestly, my best experiences with networking was just going on LinkedIn, looking up a company I'm interested in and just filtering by Tufts alum and reaching out and I would say 70% of time they will message back and say like hey yeah I have an hour tomorrow afternoon let's touch base and it's always been a really great experience. That's great to hear. Um, Thank you everyone for sharing. Uh, I I wanted to follow up with you Amy. You um, you both you are navigating the long-term setting as a dietitian, and you also have some interest in transitioning to another uh, field. Um, Tell us if you have had opportunities of networking in different fields um, and and if you find any differences or similarities. And I guess this question, I um, want to also ask Emily who has also had different interests, both uh, science and also career development. Have you found like any similarities on how to network, which people to look for, uh, or, or any differences? Sure. So I would say it's definitely very intimidating transitioning fields, um, especially because I only really found out I really like data in the last year or so. So it's really been reaching out to, like I said, fellow alum who have data experience or currently working in data, um, trying to work on as many projects as possible. Um, I would say healthcare versus data is very different in terms of networking. Healthcare is very um, personal. They don't care so much about projects. 
Um, they really want to know, like, do you know someone who knows someone? Do you have the clinical experience? Um, well, in data, it's really about build, building like more of a portfolio, showing the skills that you have, um, and also do some networking. But I would say it's not as big as it is in healthcare. Um, some similarities between the two would be, um, I think, like Alana said, you have to learn to brag about yourself. Um, like a lot of times I just say like, oh, I'm just a clinical dietitian. But then when I'm at interview, I, I get to be like, oh, I'm a dietitian with experience in food service and clinical nutrition. And I deal with um, patients of all different spectrum, you know, like and it becomes a lot more elaborate. So it's really getting your elevator, elevator pitch down, learning to talk about yourself talk up experiences that you know that the recruiter or the, um, the person would be interested in hiring and then keeping some, like being aware of what's interesting to them and then, you know, talking about that. Emily, do you have um, some experience that you could share about uh, differences between interests and fields that you have uh, experienced? Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think I've figured out that I really like a career where I'm doing different things. I mean, that's something that I love about this, like variety of being a coach and consultant for, for different people and different companies. Um, I, sorry, I was just looking at some of the questions too. Maybe we'll get back to those. But um, I think that, specifically because I you know, have my own business, right? That is, I think an online presence is even more important. I mean, I think an online, we can go back to it. An online presence is useful anyway, but I think, for example, like if you wanna do consulting or something like that, um, the online presence is even more important. Um, I think that, you know, in science, the, you know, science compared to business, I think there's a huge difference kind of in how people um, approach networking. I think in just the types of stuff people are interested in based on the differences in the field, right? In science, you talk about your research papers. Um, and it, when you're trying to transition from like science to industry, you um, people are, I would say, are more interested in like soft skills, um, right? And the way, and not necessarily that you're an absolute expert in like a very specific field, um, but you know, what are those transferable skills that you can apply to the new job, right? So if you're, um, you have a master's degree or like an advanced degree and something you're gonna do a thesis or a dissertation and like the topic of the dissertation is not necessarily as important as the skills of research and problem solving and project management and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you, Amy and Emily. Um, Alisa or Alana, have you had um, experiences in networking across different fields that you would like to add? I mean, I've been lucky enough to be kind of in the food security, food policy space uh, since college. Um, so I luckily found my my niche and kind of <laughs> uh, went with it. But um, uh, oh, one thing that I think is helpful, no matter which field you're kind of going in through that I do myself and then I some mentors that I've had work with them on uh, mentees is to kind of write down what you're doing like every like month mm -hmm. every few months just keep track of what you're doing at, at work um, because you never want it I think it's helpful for cover letters resume that sort of thing but also it helps kind of create some talking points and think through like what are my skills what are main things I can pull out here no matter who I'm talking to is it this project I did these specific skills and here's like the tidbit of how I would talk about it so that you can pull those no matter who, who you're talking to to really highlight what you've been doing because it you might be working on a project and think you know it's not that big a thing but when you actually write down and think of like all the things you did in that project and all the depending on what it is, but the different units maybe you worked with, or the different skills that you use. Um, it can also kind of help boost that confidence to be like, 
oh, look at all these great things that I'm doing that I can use when I'm networking and talking to people about, oh, I saw you're doing this and here's how what I'm doing relates to that um, or can help expand what, you, what you're doing. Yeah, and I would just say, um, I, I guess I did kind of make a leap from academic research to policy research. Um, I didn't do a ton of like work in policy networking before that just kind of happened, which was fortuitous for me. But I think that uh, a really good way to get involved in kind of a, a different field is attending conferences. And so learning about what national or statewide meetings happen in the field that you're trying to be in and attending those, I think a like helps you really clarify like that you are interested in it and kind of learn about what's going on in the field from the different researchers that are presenting there. And B gives you a really good opportunity to have a leg up in a cold email. Like I, I've gotten a lot of interesting informational interviews out of conference presenters who have shared their email and I follow up with them after the conference and say, I heard your presentation at this, like, and it was, I was interested in these things that you were talking about. Would I'm new to the field. Would you have 30 minutes to talk with me sometime in the next few weeks? And for the most part, that has really worked out. And so that, that might make the cold email less scary to say, you did share your email with the conference attendees and I was a conference attendee and, you know, listen to your session. Um, so that has been, I really like conferences. And if you can, um, Another thing, I'm just a big proponent of like state-based advocacy. And I know that Alana is really involved in the Massachusetts scene, obviously, and in Oregon, um, attending like the Oregon Program Evaluator Network Conference was a good way for me when I first moved here to be like, who are the players in the state? What's going on? You know, it's a pretty small community out here. So just kind of understanding uh, who who is making decisions, who is doing research, and then being able to connect with those people. It's kind of like a roster of who you might want to look, look out for or contact. So I think um, I'm a big proponent of academic and research conferences. Do you mind Thank if you. I add to that? Sorry. Do you mind if I add yeah. to that? Yes, please, Emily. Um, I just, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention, yeah, that I got a I got a job directly from following up with someone at a conference. And so, you know, I support that. And, and I guess I was thinking a little bit more about, you know, if you're nervous to cold email, like how you're doing it, right. Eliza touched on it. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, people are more likely to respond if you, you know, you do a little bit of research on their background um, and, and you can easily through LinkedIn, right. Kind of pick out something where you feel like you have an overlapping interest, you know, if you're not, I mean, an alumni obviously is an easy connection, but, you know, even if they did a project at an organization that you're interested in, you mentioned that, right? And that will, you know, be make it more likely that they'll respond and you can build a connection that's like more genuine. So. Thank you. Go can ahead. I build off that too? Um, I just want to add to, I think something that's been at least helpful for me is staying up to date on has Eliza had said what's happening nationally, but just like following, you know, different newsletters may seem like a small thing, but I think if there's ways you can tie into what you're doing to kind of what the national focus and movement is at the time, um, that's been really important too. So um, like, you know, following the White House has different newsletters, different nonprofits, if you're in food security, like the Food Research and Action Fracks, um, just kind of keeping your pulse on whatever field you're in, what the hot topics are, so that you're also then um, marketing what you're doing and how it relates to that, but also reaching out to people who might be in that space um, to, to say, hey, I know what's going on and here's here's why I'd love to connect to you to learn more about it or how, you know, we can uh, podcast someone put in the chat. That's also great um, as well. Yes, that's, that's, um, that's very important. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Alana. I, I wanted to go back to um, the conferences and events uh, topic that, um, that some of you mentioned uh, that conferences have been opportunities to, you know, get to know people, um, email them, and um, and just uh, learning what is happening uh, in the field. And 
I wanted to ask if any of you or if, if all of you have um, or had a specific strategy to meet um, and talk to people you were interested in working with or uh, had a plan when you went to conferences or events to, to do something, schedule things or do things in advance. Um, yeah, I, uh, Elisa. Yeah, I, I think it's obviously challenging in the mostly virtual environment that we've been in for two years now. Um, I think in-person conferences are kind of, well, it's a double-edged sword. I think meeting people in person can be more intimidating, but it also can give you a more rich experience to base a relationship off of. And it might be harder to, to make kind of a genuine connection over LinkedIn or some other um, professional networking platform. But I normally don't do as, I mean, my pre-work for a conference is normally looking at the invited speakers and their bios and seeing where my interests overlap with work that they do. And then following up after the conference to have the, to be able to put the sentence in the email, like, I, I listened to your talk on this. I really appreciated you bringing up these points. Um, and this is, like Alana said, this is where I think our interests overlap. Could I have 30 minutes of your time? Um, and again, that, that connection is even virtually is kind of a leg up of just a true cold email um, by saying, I listen to your work. I'm really interested in it, you know, kind of flattering them, but that's easier to do after the conference. Once you've like heard what they have to say in their presentations, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eliza. Um, does anyone else have had experience or a plan when they go to uh, conferences or events? I'd say um, for me, it was also, I think, personally easier pre-COVID, pre um, but I think we're all learning in this virtual realm how to do it. But I'd say have your pitch ready, um, kind of pr practice it, your self-pitch of, of who you are and, and what you're doing. Um, I've been known to hang around after um, a session, waiting for to go up and actually talk to someone um, and connect with them right then and say, you know, whether it's here's my resume or here's what I'm doing, I'd love to, you know, um, connect with you on LinkedIn and, and sometimes depending on who they are being like, can we get, you know, a picture to share on Twitter or something um, where you're able to talk with them kind of right then so that you're remembering what was happening, but also um, just practicing that pitch. So no matter who it is, you're, you know, it's a lot easier, um, I find, to just go with it when you have that elevator pitch ready and you've, you know, you can practice it ahead of time. And I pace around. <laughs> I find that helps with my memory if I pace and read out loud. Um, yeah, so Thank you. Um, Emily or Amy, would you like to share? I mean, I think it was really well said already. I mean, I think maybe in terms of a virtual world, right? Like I go to, you know, online seminars and workshops and stuff. And so I think that's in a virtual world, um, you know, and then I just follow up via LinkedIn. And I think that's most people will accept you. Um, so, but I think it was really well said already. Yeah, same. Um, I think I'm, I was trying to think back to um, in-person conferences and it's been so long that I, I don't think I really remember. But I think now that I've seen a lot more virtual conferences, I do see a lot of people say like connect with me on LinkedIn or here's my email, reach out. And um, I would say like 80% of the time if I message them within like 24, 48 hours of a presentation, mm -hmm. they'll get back to me and, you know, um, like it was mentioned, like, no, a little flattery. Like, I really like your presentation. Uh, here are the points I agree with. Here are the points I don't agree with. You want to chat about it. And yeah, they'll get back to you. It's very, you know, like I said earlier, these are also human beings. They also have interests, you know, just show some interest in what they do, who they are, and they're, they're more, much more likely to respond. Can I just add one more last point to that is that I think with the, the virtual environment, engagement can be really low for seminars and conferences. You know, people are all kind of zoomed out 
attending these seminars and then kind of signing off and not doing anything. So the silver lining is that I think it's a great opportunity if you do follow up with someone with genuine interest on their work or their research, people really take that to heart. And I think are excited that someone was really paying attention and really actually wants to reach out to them. So um, I think that's, yeah, maybe the the silver lining of the moment is that when you do show genuine interest, it it means more almost that, that you weren't just tuned out of another Zoom meeting, but you were really listening to what they were saying. Um, so just following up. Thank you, Eliza. Um, and, and following up on that, um, and that idea of, of contacting someone uh, because you're interested in, in their research or working with them, in your experience before, um, uh, as, um, before coming into your current role, was there a person or uh, a fellow student, a professor, a mentor who you think played a key role where you, while you were uh, looking for your position? Um, and if there was one, what did that person do to, to help you? Alana? Yeah, I think I mentioned some of this earlier, but um, I sat with Jerry Mand when he was at um, Friedman, who had worked on the Hill and at the USCA and at the White House. Um, and so I had exp different experience in different areas that I was considering at the time um, to talk about what it was really like in those different settings and and what impact you can have. I think in policy, there's so many different areas where you can make an impact, whether that's at the local level, the state legislature level, Congress, White House, federal government. I mean, there's so many touch points within that process where you can really make a difference to figure out um, what it's actually like. So I think talking again, as I had said with professors about their experience on the ground, um, can be illuminating. <laughs> I think I had a very different vision in my head of what some of these positions would actually be and talking to him about, well, you know, you might have some influence here in this area, but not really as much, you know, as you could at, at a different place um, impacted my decision and where in the policy chain, you know, at least in, for now, um, where I wanted to be and get that experience to see, you know, where, where to next. Um, so I suggest kind of reaching out to people in the job that you want to have, which I think Emily had mentioned before. Um, so I, you know, have reached out to people at the USDA before and just been like, you know, what's it, what is it like to be in the federal government role? Um, what kind of influence can you have? What does it look like? I think asking people what a day-to-day -day experience is like can be very illuminating too, um, into what a job is actually like, and that can help kind of give you a picture of maybe that's not really what I want to do. I had a different, you know, idea in my head, or that sounds great. <laughs> that's something I really want to do. Um, and then they can connect you with, well, then other people, you know, might be good to talk to in that space. Thank you, Alana. Um, Emily, would you like to share? Um, yeah, I was just building off of that for, for a second. I thought of you know, I think people, I think podcasts, I don't know. I just like podcasts. I think there's a lot of podcasts, even where people will just talk about their job. Um, so it's great to do like in-person informational interviews, but in the, this world also like people get a lot of messages. And so kind of, you can even do research before you talk to someone about like what the job would be like. So you can like through a podcast or a video or something. So you can even get more ask more, you know, useful, specific questions, like if you're a little bit more prepared. Um, and then I was gonna talk about a mentor who I had kind of on the science um, business side. I was, you know, kind of re recently, I'm, you know, went through this where I I'm, was thinking maybe about going back for a PhD or an MBA, um, cause I feel like I'm really interested in the intersection of science and business. Um, and so I talked to, you know, a food science professor, uh, at UC Davis who has, you know, he's a professor, but he collaborates a lot with industry and has worked on a few different startups based on his research. Um, and he was really helpful in, you know, getting, you know, but he was a great person to talk to about, you know, do I really need a PhD, you know, what is it, you know, or an MBA or what, what is my next career step, so. 
Thank you, Emily. Eliza, um, would you like to share um, about your experience? Yeah, I, um, I'll give a shout out to Reese Lyerly for those who may know him on the call. He's a current PhD student at Friedman. Um, he was my internship advisor. I had an internship my second year of my Friedman master's program um, and worked with him down at the Rhode Island Health Public Health Institute. Um, and he has been just a wonderful mentor for me. Um, I think that obviously our, our interests overlap and align a lot, but he just has been such a champion for me and like a cheerleader for, for going and being proactive and, and kind of um, really just supporting me. Like, I don't know, he, he's not, I think it, oftentimes also people think that a professional mentor needs to be like a tenured professor or have decades of experience under their belt. And I don't actually think that that is necessarily the case. Um, Reese is just a very like driven individual. And so I've kind of just fallen in line behind his, his excitement and passion for the field. And it's very exciting to have someone who is as passionate about their work as they are about like supporting me. So I felt really lucky um, to have him. And he was a reference for my, for my job that I have now um, and just has been great. And so even if you're, if you don't end up kind of in the same exact career um, or same exact job as, as your mentor, if you have someone who is really just supportive of you and your professional development goals, whatever they are, um, that's definitely a person to keep close and, and have, you know, by your side in the job search and can be a sounding board for you. And again, even if they're not um, doing exactly the same thing, if they're willing to be supportive and listen, then that is really kind of the, the best that you can ask for. Amy. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I have one specific mentor. I've definitely had a lot of people I looked up to in my job search and in my career path. Um, a lot of people I've reached out to. Um, I would say um, just connect with as many people as possible. I hope one night to find a mentor as great as yours, Eliza. That sounds awesome. Um, but most of my mentors have been very um, supportive. They've, you know, um, helped me get to the next step. And then when I get find kind of like a new mentor, they say, okay, you're, you know, you're ready to fly now. <laughs> um, and I go on to someone else, but they've all been, um, I would say the one advice I've gotten from all of them is um, connect with as many people as you can, stay curious, um, always ask questions. Um, and so that's something that's advice I've really taken on throughout my career so far is just constantly connecting with people, asking them about what they do, what it is. And that's, you know, that's part of how I found that I really like data was I just, I took a stats course, asked some questions and realized, oh, hey, I, I actually like data a lot more than I like doing clinical. <laughs> so, um, and so that's why I, I think it's really important just to um, stay connected and um, find a lot of mentors because each one also provides a different lesson. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. And that also brings me to the chat questions. Um, there's one question about how can people engage in reciprocal relationships and exchanges with your network? Uh, what would be some, uh, some practices, some good practices for this? Um, would anyone want to uh, take a stab to this question, audience question? Sure, I can start. Um, I think one, if, if you see that one of the people you've connected with has done something great, reaching out to them and just saying like, you know, even on LinkedIn, just a comment, you know, like this is so great or, um, you know, congratulations, whatever it is, or um, this is really interesting, would love to talk more about it. So I think there's that side of it as well as when you've done something and you're reaching out and sharing it, I'm just like, hey, I thought you might be interested either in this article we just published or um, this project we just worked on, would love to tell you more about it and hear how things are going, you know, and, and, uh, for you and just, just little check-ins to just um, to remind people of who you are and what you're doing, but also to stay engaged in what they're doing, um, I think is an important part of it too, which is also just a great learning experience in general, like knowing what's happening in the field you're interested in um, and just showing that continued engagement 
in that space. Thank you, Alana. Um, Elisa? Yeah, two quick things I would add to that. Um, yeah, staying engaged, I think uh, a low bar, but an easy way to do that. I mean, LinkedIn is a social media platform and liking, um, you know, people's statuses, commenting on what, you know, when people are sharing their accomplishments, we just published this paper, or we just came out with this, you know, we just got this big grant for a research project, commenting on that saying, you know, all of those things can make, even if you don't know the person that well, or very personally, I think it's still kind of gets your name in their head that like, oh, this per person is supportive of what I'm doing. And then if you do reach out to them later, um, you know, with an ask or, or just to reach out, then they feel might feel more familiar with you. Um, and I think the second thing is that we, of course, often think about, you know, as mentees or early career professionals, like asking uh, people for letters of recommendation. But I have been in some situations where one of my managers or one of my mentors is applying for a role where they asked for a letter of recommendation from a supervisee. Um, and I've been able to provide that um, feedback for that job application. And so that I, you know, it's, it's not as common as asking for letters of rec from a manager or someone who supervised you, but that does happen, especially um, maybe for, for internship roles or for, um, managerial positions where they want to know where where the job wants to know like the perspective of someone who has been managed by the applicant and so if you can just kind of offer that to be to be a resource for them if that ever comes up that's a way to have a, a more reciprocal relationship professionally as well thank you Eliza um I would like to um open the microphone if anyone would like to um uh, ask a question. I know that there are a few in the chat. I don't know if um, Angelica, uh, Rafida, uh, would you like to to ask your question? Or sure, I, could I can also. ask my question. I'm just Go wondering ahead. if, oh, thank you. <laughs> the panelists, if you have any advice, because you've been talking a lot about um, your online presence, so thinking about LinkedIn, but like other social networks, maybe Twitter or anything that you've run into that's really helpful. Um, and also considering personal websites or online resumes, which is something that I've also seen uh, pop up, especially in the past couple of years. And I know that someone mentioned about how hard it's been with that transition to fully online versus being in person for conferences and stuff like that. I think it was Alana. So I would just love to hear about how important has that online presence been for you and the kinds of social networks that you're in tune with. Yeah, I could start. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I, I've used it a lot and I think it's been great. Um, you know, what Eliza was saying, right? Just to even like or comment on people's posts to get them on your radar. Um, I think, you know, depending on the type of role you're interested, right? Like a personal website or a portfolio website can be really necessary. Um, but for other roles that, you know, like a LinkedIn is, is probably fine. Um, and yeah, Twitter is big. Um, it kind of in like the academic science realm. I mean, I, cause I was kind of in that for a while. So it's like, so it is pretty big on like science and science communication. So I would, if you're in that space, um, maybe policy too. I'm just not as familiar with policy. They can, they can speak to that. But yeah, I think Twitter is probably the next biggest professional social media platform after LinkedIn. So probably use those two. I use those two professionally. Um, but more LinkedIn. And I have a, I personally have a basic website, but I think, you know, if you do something, I think a website's not a bad idea. I think but if you have a good LinkedIn profile and your Twitter, you don't need a website anymore. That's my perspective. Yeah, I can add that in policy. Twitter is big too. <laughs> um, I'd say I, uh, on and off of it, have used Twitter to, um, either connect with food security um, advocates or if you're at FRAX conference, Twitter is really big, um, as well as sharing like research in the space. And um, there can be, you know, conversations 
on certain topics. So I'd say Twitter is big. I also, every few months, just Google yourself and see what comes up. Um, it's always just good to know if someone's heard your name and looks you up, you know, what comes up and that can also help determine whether profiles you might want or need, um, when you're thinking of branding yourself. So if my LinkedIn came up, what, what image would people get of me? If my Twitter came up, you know, um, and if they are not for networking, you know, their personal accounts, I also suggest privating them, um, if they're not, you know, professional facing. Um, so just being wary of that. And then I think also like if there's articles about you or the work that you've done, making sure those are on your LinkedIn and have been shared on your Twitter and um, those sorts of places so that if someone does look you up, all of your things can be in one general area. Um, I'd say more in the academic space, maybe a website where you have your CV. Um, I mean, LinkedIn is good where you can put all your published research there. Um, so thinking through, you know, those sorts of places. Thank you so much. Um, Eliza or Amy, do you have anything um, to add to this question or? Um... I, think, I think Emily and Alana covered it. I, I'm a big proponent of LinkedIn. I'm not as big on Twitter, but um, I think just having an up-to-date LinkedIn profile and, and connecting with people and following organizations on Twitter that are on, on LinkedIn that are interesting to you. So you can get that employee search if you're ever looking for, for job opportunities there and seeing where you have connections or where Friedman alumni work. Um, that has been a, a helpful tool for me. Yeah, I agree with that. LinkedIn is huge for me. Um, I'm not really on Twitter except when I'm at a conference so I can tweet all the hashtags. <laughs> um, but I would say um, really look into your industry. Um, for example, like when I got my health, uh, my clinical job, I don't think my administrator even knew um, how to use LinkedIn. So I don't think she would have found me at all through LinkedIn. And so in healthcare, I do find that it tends to be a little bit slower, but then the tech space, definitely like you better have your LinkedIn up to, um, you know, updated. And even some companies want to see the personal website, they want to see the portfolio, and they want to see that you have interests outside of just work, you know, a lot of these personal websites, you'll see that they have like photography or music or, you know, other things that they're interested in. And that's really important to an employer. But you don't really get to showcase that on your LinkedIn necessarily. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you. Um, it looks like we have come uh, to the end of this symposium. Uh, I would like to thank um, our wonderful presenters who have shared their experiences. And also I would like to thank the audience for such interesting questions and conversations. Um, I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>